And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Vindicated Entertainment, aim at the, one of the few, one of the only person... So I know who will uh, who will who will vociferously defend Zero Two as best girl, the and the creator of the recently fun the recently funded other other worlds, the one and only Vincent Baker. How you doing today, man? Hello, brother Mildra. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me again. Uh, this is my third time uh, on the show, so I'm happy to be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, who in their right mind would not defend Zero Two as a perfect waifu? I mean, <laughs> it's a very she's a very obvious choice. I mean, in so many ways. But we're not gonna. Th this isn't the topic for today's discussion, of course. But I'm just saying, if anyone <laughs> needs to hit me up in my DMs, I'm more than willing to talk. <laughs> God, if I if I. I better not end up starting a waifu war. I'd rather go through succession wars <laughs> for another 250 years. Hey, leave uh, some comments below if you want to uh, if you want us to have some sort of waifu discussion in a separate video. Oh god. Um, <laughs> so the first time that I had you on, I did I asked I asked about the humble origins, and I, and admittedly around that time I was just trying to go with a all encompassing thing invo involving. Um, the various projects, but obviously for this one, I need to specifically focus on Other Worlds. Now, as I understand it, Other Worlds is a project that's been per that had been percolating in your mind for a long while. Yeah, that's that's very true. Like Other Worlds, uh, basically is the summation of uh, of basically my childhood imagination. I mean, when I was a kid. I had a very overreactive imagination, and uh, you know, as with most kids, you'd run around pretending like there's monsters, goblins, trolls, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. uh, waving around a stick, pretending to fight, you know, bad guys. You'd join up with your friends and you know, run around the the woods together or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, that's exactly what I did, and uh, for a long time, I was just interested in the fantasy uh, aspects of things. Um, so it was very much, you know, your trolls, goblins, swords, that kind of stuff. Um, and I absolutely hated anything sci-fi up until about the age of, I think, uh, 12, something around there. And it was because I stayed the night over my cousin's house. And I woke up early in the morning and he was asleep. And that guy sleeps like, like, like he sleeps uh, so hard that it's so hard to wake him up. That I knew that he was going to be out for hours after I got up because I happened to wake up at the crack of dawn. So I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? So I saw that in his PlayStation, he had a game called Ratchet and Clank. And I was like, oh, it has, it has sci fi elements. I don't care about sci fi. But I just played it because I was super bored out of my mind. And it turns out that I fell in love with Ratchet and Clank. It was an amazing game. I loved it. Um, and Ratchet and Clank, I, I, give, uh, I, I give credit to uh, basically allowing me to, to start loving some sci fi elements, to love. Uh, some unique weapons and the idea of having like you know element uh, elemental attachments and uh, some funny humor and just some crazy stuff going on in your sci-fi worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got from that I got in, into uh, Jack and Daxter, which you know starting with Jack Two, uh, it had some uh, great sci-fi elements to it. Got into Halo, Gears of War, uh, Borderlands. So I, I of course was still into the uh, into the fantasy stuff. I was always a Final Fantasy fan. And then with all this extra stuff kind of added in, um, it just started becoming a part of my life. And when I was an older kid slash young teenager, um, I actually created something that my friends and I called the mission game. And the mission game was this idea that I would create lists of different missions that we would do. And uh, they would each have different rewards where you'd get different amounts of money and you'd get different weapons, you'd get upgrades. And I actually had like a whole armory set up. I had all these like fake like nerf guns and water guns and stuff. And uh, they each function differently. And I'd have everyone basically role play out their character. They'd determine what t type of weapons they'd want, what kind of missions they'd go on. We had different types of missions. We had ones where they'd be vehicle based where we'd get in our car 
Well, at the time we couldn't drive, so it would have to be. We could only do a vehicle-based mission when, like, our parents were going somewhere or our grandparents were going somewhere, and we'd get in the car with them and we'd be, be pretending to shoot enemies like on the street that'd be other cars. And if we didn't shoot them enough before they passed us, they would deal a point of damage to us, and it would lower our vehicle's health by one. And I had this whole like game system set up around this, and it's just something. That at the time I had no idea what I was doing, but what I was doing was really crazy. I had no idea what role playing was. I had no idea like what tabletop RPGs really were. I was just creating a game the way that made sense to me, and I would sit there and role play out different NPCs as we go about doing things. the The biggest difference is back then we weren't embarrassed to be running around with Nerf guns, uh, pretending to shoot people and stuff because you know we were little kids, so no one thought anything about it, and uh, we were just having fun, and it was basically like LARPing. Um, and then uh, I just decided, you know what, like, I missed that, that was a lot of fun, and, uh, I just wanted to make it into a game, so, in 2010, I started a website, uh, I think it was 2000, it was at least 2010, uh, but I started a website, and, uh, I published, like, game rules on the website for Other Worlds, and, uh, it mostly started off as, uh, people that I knew in my immediate circle, uh, some of my close friends and family, and uh, then we ended up having, like, we went from, like, five users to 10 to 20 uh, to 30 to 40. We had events going on uh, from the website. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we literally just, we basically did what we used to do, like, uh, in person, you know, the live action role playing. And we did it through this website. And that was kind of the first introduction. And, and then I brought it into the, uh, the tabletop space. Um, I just peeled it off the computer, put it out, uh, put it out there, and, you know, had people play it in person. And, uh... So it's it's been a part of my life. I mean, the mission game is kind of what became Other Worlds. Uh, and I, I haven't actually, I don't think I've spoken publicly about it being called the mission game at first, but that was, of course, before it was, like, made into a, a game for the public. Um, and then uh, at a certain point, I was like, well, the mission game's kind of a dumb name. I, I need to come up with a better name. Uh, so the first name I came up with, actually, was called The Darkest Weapon. Uh, because the idea was on one of the planets, which is uh, currently Xylos, mm -hmm. um, they have basically dark astral, and with that, they can actually uh, basically s superpower weapons, and uh, with it, there's a ton of energy, but of course, with it being dark, it's, uh, it's corrupting in nature. Uh, it's not good stuff that you want to mess with, but people that you know seek power uh, are willing to take that risk, uh, even if it means the endangerment of everyone around them. And so a lot more of the plot focused on that. So it's called The Darkest Weapon because of that. But uh, since then, I sort of moved it away from that specific focus and just made that as uh, kind of uh, part of the backdrop of what Other Worlds is all about. And Other Worlds in itself is a more encompassing title. But there's my story about the names and where it came from. And I think that's the most in-depth I've went about it in person. So hopefully people will enjoy hearing that. Yeah. Now, with these... With the um, set now, I will I will freely admit that I ca that I came across it. I came across the system that Otherworlds uses by accident um, when when um, I ended up do I ended up doing my usual dig my usual digging about and came across um, bunkers and badasses. Which, okay, cool. I actually did not know that's how you came across Otherworlds. Yeah, that's how that's how I came across Otherworlds, and then through and then through that came across the re the rest of your work. Um, and of course, of course, of course. Then there's the announcement about an official one, which um, I'd l which I'd like to say I'm optimistic for, but I have um issues with Randy. Many issues. That's fair. <laughs> I, th I think I think most people uh, do at least at least a little bit, at least a tiny bit. Um, but regardless, uh, I don't think Randy is in charge of the tabletop RPG, but we'll see where it goes. I did pre-order it just because uh, so many people. Uh, know me now for liking Borderlands, and it's kind of a part of Vindicated as, as sort of like our, our love for Borderlands. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like it would make sense for our channel uh, just to get the get the game, uh, play it a couple times, uh, review it, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and... <sighs> At at the very at the very least you at the very least you can when it comes to the subtitle of the years you can say you can say now with a hundred percent less greasy. <laughs> <laughs> but when it when it comes to, now when it comes to the when it comes to the um, setup, um, 
one thing that I one thing that I find I find very I find very interesting when I was look when I was looking through um, some of some of the some of the um, do, some of the documents and then as well as um, other and as well as the stripped down version uh, in Other World Zero was the was the fact that if I'm if I'm not mistaken you're doing a you're doing a kind of um, class and that class and then tree um set up when it comes to character design is that accurate sure yeah i i would say that's accurate i i'm assuming there's other tabletop rpgs that's messed with having some sort of skill tree and stuff um I, i'm absolutely certain because there's so many tabletop rpgs out there not as uh, but as i will think okay well i was gonna say i'm not i'm not familiar with any um and what the reason why i'm saying that is because uh, a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but sometimes whenever I'm designing a game, um, when I'm doing something I haven't seen before, I don't exactly know what to call it or how to classify it, uh, which can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. It's not good for marketing. It's also not good for me being able to answer your question, uh, if that's indeed what it is or not. Um, the best way I can describe it for myself or for others is to say, you know, it, it's basically... Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's basically like you create your own class is the way I look at it. The class is just the name uh, that's given to your character. And it's there because I think it helps to have some sort of uh, role, even if the role is a little bit uh, loose or not strictly defined. I think it helps people to know like, hey, that's our fighter. Hey, that's our tank. That's our healer. You know, to have your class sort of designate like what your overall purpose is. And it doesn't mean that you have to stick to that the entire time, but... I think if you just have something completely classless, you can run into um, problems of players overlapping a lot. Like you might have uh, more chances of more people being like, "Well, I thought I was supposed to be the tank, or I was supposed to take the damage, and I thought you were supposed to heal, and you're supposed to do the." And I feel like it kind of runs into that issue. But on the flip side of that, when you go into class-based RPGs, a lot of times the classes are very rigid, and it's like, "Oh, well, this is all you can do." And since you're the fighter, we know that all you can do is move up and hit stuff. Like, that's, like, your thing, and that will always be your thing. And, of course, you can sort of spec into some other stuff, but in general, that's what it is. So, mm -hmm. really, the other world system is meant to sort of be a, a, a hybrid between that. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be um, more flexible than your typical class-based systems, but it's meant to be... Uh, it's, it's meant to give you uh, a little bit more identity than just being completely classless. And I also think it's just fun to be able to name your class, whatever you want, because uh, I come from playing uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, and I, I love that game so much, and uh, there are certain classes in that game that uh, especially the bad guys have, and they're basically the same as some of your classes, but they have like slight differences to them, but they have a completely different name. So anytime I'd see uh, a character that had the Nightblade class instead of a knight, I would be like, ooh, what's Nightblade mean? And there would be differences there even if they were minor they made a big difference gameplay wise um so i always thought that was fascinating so i just want to carry that over to other worlds yeah and i will admit so i will admit something that i do f that i do find interesting with this with this particular setup is despite is despite despite having a despite having a whole lot of the fantastical elements you have n you have not fallen into the into the trap of of ma of mages get of mages get to do everything interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very true. I mean, it, it kind of throws people off a, a bit at first, I think, uh, sometimes. But um, every every class in the game, or whatever class you end up making, uh, will have basically the same leveling up structure, and so you'll you'll sort of have the same amount of things to do uh, in general. I mean, there's some you know a few exceptions here and there. Um, but to me, uh, one thing I've learned about game design is there's a lot of different players that enjoy a lot of different things. So the trick for me is to try to make every angle of it enjoyable. So even so, if you enjoy the the fighter or the tank or the spellcaster or the assassin or whatever it may be, I want you to be able to have a lot of fun with that, and it should feel enjoyable, mm -hmm. um, even if some of those things aren't. I, and I think one thing that helps with that, too, is I've managed to make it so, for myself, I'm able to find something I enjoy about each of those things myself. Because a lot of times people have their preferences, 
Um, I even have my own preferences when it comes to like what I like to play. However, my preferences over the years have diminished in terms of uh, me being more accepting of playing sort of outside of my my natural bubble, and now I can find something to enjoy with any type of character. So even like a berserker wouldn't normally be my type of character, but now that I've you know uh, played in RPGs for a while and I just have a more open mind to th- uh, to things and. I'm just very, uh, I don't know, I'm able to find things to enjoy about it, especially within the other world system, because there's so much to mess with. Mm-hmm. Now, even with, even with all, with all the, um, customiz- with all the customization, which I, th- I think, I think it would be fair of me to say that customization is the, ba- is the battle cry of other worlds design. Um, th- throughout yeah, all I'd that, agree with that. Throughout all of that, you're using a D10, um, setup. Um, a D6 setup. I don't know. I don't know why I said D10. I may have. I may have been looking at a previous draft when I said that. Um, but you're just you're you're just using a single D6. And was that something that you ha- that you had um, that you had decided on or that you decided on from the get go, or was that the result of a lot of testing? It's uh, a great question. Um, so it, it's mo- so it started off as being. Um, Funny enough, a lot of other worlds, I mean, like I said, I, I first made it when I was a teenager. Um, so needless to say, the game wasn't the best uh, at the time when I made it. Um, it. It had a lot of flaws, but it had a lot of things that were charming, uh, that was charming about it. A lot of things, I mean, ultimately the thing was, is like, it's still some of the most fun I've ever had. Uh, and a lot of people can tell you, I mean, I'm sure you've had these experiences too, where you've probably played a game that you can look at right now and say, okay, it's not the best designed, but I had a lot of fun playing that game. And it could have just been that, you know, you and your friends are able to look past those things and just have a good time. Um, so one of my things that I just don't want a lot of things uh, in the way of obscuring for a good time, so that that's something that kind of runs through other worlds. And whether that's rolling one or two dice doesn't matter in, in terms of for that, but I'm just throwing that out there as a thing. Mm. Um, but... I don't. I don't know why, but just as a uh, kid and a teenager, uh, it just was like, oh, we just roll roll a dice and see what happens. Now, with that being said, uh, there are things in the game that allow you to uh, gain edge, which is uh, what we call uh, basically the advantage disadvantage type mechanic uh, from other systems. Mm-hmm. Um, but with with edge, the biggest difference is, is it can stack multiple times. So if you gain if you if you gain two edge, you can roll three dice and then you choose the two highest. And you get to keep the two highest, and you remove the lowest. Um, so it's something that can keep being amplified up. And in other worlds, all your dice explode. So being able to gain edge and being able to have multiple dice explode uh, allow you a lot of variance in the game. Because I feel like whenever they hear, oh, you just roll one six-sided dice, uh, they may think it's very, um, it's very like stilted, and there's not much variance going on there. There's not much that can happen. But since dice explode, since there's uh, abilities and scenarios in which you might roll extra dice or gain edge or lose edge, uh, there's actually a lot of variants that come with that. And with it being a D6 system, um, each of the dice that are rolled ends up adding a lot to the overall um, the overall importance. Uh, because on a six out of die, each number represents a greater portion of the dice. Uh, so it's going to like... There, there's a lot more that can happen with that. <laughs> and of course, there a another significant advantage that I can that I can see with ha, with um only having a single D six is your is um your it's going to put it's going to put a lot more burden on the um on the core on the core modifiers to to uh, determine how well you're going to succeed or fail and th- and thus you're not going to have as you're not going to have the case of Hey, I've got a five percent chance that you, and so, someone trying to roll anyways, even when they sh- even when they really shouldn't. Um, because you because you've probably seen that as as well as I have, where somebody th- somebody thinks, well, you've got you've got you've got to get you've got to roll eight you've got to roll nineteen or higher. Hey, I still hey that's a ten percent chance. I'll take it, and then and then they end up not then they have get end up fumbling and they have only themselves to blame. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it, and it's it's something that I definitely recommend people trying, you know, and playing, uh, giving the system a try, because uh, I have faced, um, I won't say some backlash, but I've definitely faced people 
sort of give me the side eye about the idea of just using a couple, you know, one to two D6s whenever you roll. Um, just because it seems so... Uh, it just seems so basic, I guess, is a good a good way to put it. But really, uh, just through playtesting and playing it and stuff, like, you know, it, it just goes so smooth. It's smooth like butter, you know? Like, it, everyone knows exactly what they're rolling. They can just roll it super easily. People already have a hard time, like, rolling dice off the table. That still happens with me sometimes. And the fact that it's just the, the single D6, you know, it just makes it super simple to roll. Don't have to worry about rolling off the table. Don't have to worry about, like, players choosing, like, oh, is this the D8? Is this the D10? Is this my D4s? You know, like, trying to sort through their dice. Um, it's just meant to be there so things go as quickly as possible, as smooth as possible, easy as possible. Um, a, a rule for the game design for other worlds is I don't want to add anything to the game unless it, uh, like, outweighs... Uh, the complexity by how much options and how much um, how much creativity you can use with that. So, for example, um, a lot of things are pared down to be on the simpler scale. But the character creation, the reason why that's so vast is because that's that's a that's a point in the game where it. I think the value of having those extra options for your character is worth the added complexity. Um, but I basically for any game, I think you kind of have a certain amount of com- complexity uh, or like complexity points that you can spend uh and so a large amount of the complexity points uh and i try to make things as simple as possible of course throughout the entire game uh in terms of like being easy to understand but the the bulk of it's through character creation because i want you to be able to make the characters that you want to make i don't don't want you to to feel like you can't design the type of character that you want yeah and that br- that brings me to to something else when it comes to the um when it com- when it comes to what when it comes to the setup for um for skill for skill trees namely the f- namely the fact that um there's a, there's a bit there's a bit of a there's a bit of an action economy when it comes to the skill categories that you have you have full on actions boosts passes reactions and racial um yeah, I think that covers uh, everything. Oh, there's uh, reactions. I'm not sure if you said that. I I did. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it covered everything. What I'm curious about with that is, when you were uh, when you were developing the skill trees, was it, what did you always did you always intend on having the, on having this um cor- putting aside ra- putting aside race this court this quartet of actions within it? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I, huh? The, the, I've never heard that question. It's a very interesting one. Um, everything involving the different skills and the way the skill trees laid out uh, happened very naturally, and was just uh, how it came came to be. Uh, that's the best I can say. Like, um, just certain things made sense to be done a certain way and of course we experimented with things there's a lot of changes over the years in terms of like how certain things worked exactly um it's more like a lot of tweaks here and there when it comes to the way the actions and stuff work um but you know giving it a ton of play testing and playing some other tabletop role-playing games uh we just went with whatever made sense to us and uh, also keep in mind, a lot of the players that I played Other Worlds with, especially in the beginning for the first, um, I don't know, like first, first long amount of time, I, I can't do that, like first six years or so, uh, a lot of them were players that were new to tabletop RPGs, um, but I have definitely played the game with people who are more experienced with RPGs, but a lot of the initial framework and a lot of the initial opinions uh, came from the minds of people who um were like oh this makes sense to me you know but it made sense to someone who hadn't played a lot of tabletop rpgs versus someone who has played a ton um which is pretty interesting because you know there's a whole different perspective there and it's interesting too because it's like i feel like the games that are easier for people to get into might not be the same games that people who uh, who are super into that genre uh, might want. Now, with me uh, in particular, I, I'm a fan of, like, kind of a more of a... I, I, I love playing games that don't make my head hurt, you know? Like, I'm a very, like, I'm, I'm a very, like, strategy-based person. Like, I, I used to play tons of Magic the Gathering, used to play tons of tournaments for it. Um, and 
that game has about the the highest level of strategy that I want in a game. And unfortunately, I mean, and the game designers for that game will tell you that, you know, there's a lot of complexity when it comes to Magic the Gathering. You know, they have pro players, they have a ton of people that um, they get paid good money for, for being able to outthink their opponents with it. Um, but even in that game, they just have two stats on their creatures. You have your power and toughness. Uh, you just have a different, you just have two different types of, um, of your, like, instants and sorceries for, like, your type of spells. Um, and then when you go into a tabletop RPG, uh, you have, you know, six different stats, you know, as your attributes. And then you have a long list of your different, uh, skills. And then you have, like, 25 different abilities that you can get, you know, like, whenever you get to high levels. And then you have, you know, it's like, at a certain point, uh, that stuff becomes a lot more complicated than something like Magic the Gathering, which I don't think is a good thing, uh, personally. So I try to keep Otherworld slim down and just have it be, uh, like I said, smooth as butter, but still have a lot of strategy and depth to it, because I am a, I am a fan of card games, I'm a fan of strategy RPGs, so I do like those elements in my games as well. Mm-hmm. Now, when it, now, when it comes to... When it, the other th- the when it comes to the set when it comes to the setting of other worlds you mentioned that a lot of this started out as the mi- as the mission game and because of that i'm curious how the how um how you ended up developing the set the setting of other worlds from a from a simple mission approach to to actually creating a full on setting for it yeah so that's a great question um so Definitely, when I started the mission game, that was once I was kind of like into the uh, idea of liking sci-fi some. Uh, after you know, loving fantasy already, of course. Um, hence, why it was called the mission game and not the quest game. <laughs> uh, but it is also uh, at that time it was heavily inspired by uh, Jack and Dexter because uh, you get missions in that game, you get different weapons, things like that. Um, as far as the worlds go, that's a great question. I remember. I, I mostly developed a lot of the worlds when I was 16 years old uh, in terms of, like, laying out their most basic, like, that's when I named all the worlds. And right and currently, I kind of hate some of the names <laughs> of the worlds, and I'm kind of embarrassed by them because I feel like they're not named the best. However, I feel like I'd be discrediting my 16-year-old self or, or like, I'd be... Um, I'd be like sh- shaming uh, my past self if I were to just change it after all these years. So I-, I just try to think, you know, like it's okay, Vincent. Like even though I think I could come up with a better name for this planet or this world or whatever, I will. Uh, I'll just you know grip my teeth and bear with it because it's not like horrible. And I haven't heard anyone complain about it, but I just feel like I could do better now. But anyways, mm-hmm. um, I don't. I honestly don't remember. I mean, it's it's been uh, twelve years, almost thirteen years since I've first created uh these different worlds um i don't know where i came up with the idea for them um i'm assuming that i mean i i just have a imagination that as soon as i watch something or see a game or whatever it may be if if anything like i always think about like whatever the coolest elements of the game are and then i just start like putting that in my head in my head and then i start remixing it with other elements so if i play bloodborne uh for example i love the way that the hunters are designed i love their attire you know you have this like gothic architecture and the gothic horror stuff and then maybe i see uh, i watch an episode of Yu Gi Oh, like classic Yu Gi Oh, and then there's pegasus and he has like the toon world monsters or something and i'm like oh well what if there's this world that like mixes uh, instead of it being like gothic horror that that merges into eldritch stuff, like what if there's this weird like cartoon magic? And with cartoon magic, um, it starts making the the creatures of the land actually turn into these weird cartoony creatures. Uh, and um, you know that's part of the madness instead. So it's all bright and colorful, almost like Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and it gets more and more that way as as you continue on in this world. And uh, as you use this magic, it's kind of like based off of tune magic and stuff. And I'm just like I'm literally just making this up, up off the top of my head right now. But that's kind of my my uh, my thought process when it comes to designing a world is taking these different ideas and then splicing them together, mixing them up, and then thinking to myself like, okay, well, what would tune magic be exactly, and how would I write that into my game and how could that be fun and what would players expect from that and what are some other elements i could throw into this that make it even more mixed up and even more unique oh all right i can i can certainly get behind that um (laughs) all right cool i I legit just pulled that out of my butt (laughs) (laughs) um 
that's the first the first lesson that I learned when it came, when it came to G, when it came to GMing is when in doubt make shit up. Yep. <laughs> I I do pretty good at that. Yeah. Um and when it when now given given the fact that it's given the fact that this is a very a very a very um semi free form crunch medium setup with creation advancement and customization a lot of times when pe when when things go free form or go, or go um or go semi levelless which you technically have a le a level system but not in but not in the strictest sense yeah um it can be difficult to, it can be difficult or tricky to balance encounters what systems do you have what systems do you have in, in place so so that um so that people aren't so that people aren't getting cur in, getting unfairly curb stomped when it comes to and when it comes to encounter setup yeah i'm happy you asked this question because i'm super happy with the way it's uh, set up in other worlds um so a lot of games uh this is a point of uh, th this is this is a point where anytime I show like how other games do this, I always uh, my friends always like cannot understand it, and even I struggle with understanding it for certain games. Uh, and it really throws you off too when you have like something set up for your challenge rating, and then like a player doesn't show up. It just throws everything off off course. Um, so with other worlds, it's done super simple. It's inspired mostly by something like Hero Clicks. Like it's the idea that you add together every player character's level. That's the amount of points you have, and then you can adjust those points based on the difficulty that you want. So if you want it to be easy, you just keep it as is. If you want it to be a little bit tougher, you add X amount of points. If you want it to be near impossible, you add a certain amount of points that's listed in the game. Um, once you have all those points together, you just spend it as the world master. You spend it uh, throughout the adventure, uh, throughout that session. Um, ideally, like uh, for, for whatever you think uh, their time would be between like a long rest... Um, and that would be the enemies that they face, and it's super simple to use. Um, so, if there's you know uh, five level four characters, you have twenty points. If you want to make it a little bit more difficult, say it's twenty five points, and you just spend it uh, throughout uh, that that day that they go on the, their adventure. And it's as simple as that. Yep. And um, in a weird w in a weird way, I'm reminded of the in in the, the encounter design in um, Fantasy Craft. Um. Although it's it does it's it's not doing it, although that one isn't doing exactly what you're doing, but it does ha it does have a it does have a similar um, sliding up sliding approach. Um, now when now um when it comes to when it com now when it comes to races, um there's there's been there's been two there's been two ends of a of a paradigm that I've that I've often seen. You have instances where Eight, where a race is a significant factor, like say in um, Shadowrun, where where a good where a good chunk of your stats are going to be determined by what um, metahuman you are. Um, of course, you have the whole race as class that was in old school D and D, which, truth be told, I wasn't ever, I wasn't really a, fa a fan of back then. Still, and I'm still not. Um, or you ha or you have some instances where race only seems to matter at during the first few levels and once you get once you get into the team it doesn't mean squat how how much of how much of a modifier does a uh, character's choice of race play and um does it does it still play a, does it still play a factor at high levels uh well yes it it does and it's definitely not the last thing you said where it doesn't matter at the uh at, at, at higher levels or whatever mm -hmm. um no it, it definitely matters like you know i i've i've been uh, fortunate enough to see uh hundreds of other world's characters made and and i've got to play with uh, a lot of these characters um over time uh through various campaigns i get to, i've uh played at various levels you know from low levels to high levels uh and all these characters have been vastly different which i'm proud of and um their race definitely was a huge uh, indicator as to how that character uh, functioned uh, in the game uh, from a mechanical, like outside of just the role playing aspects, but also a mechanical uh, pers perspective. Just because um, a lot of the uh, things you get for being that race holds a lot of weight to your character and will definitely uh, it it, ju it just has a lot of weight to your character. Yeah. Um. Now, now, 
something something else that I that I could I could not help but notice is see unless I, unless I am mis unless I'm mistaken despite ha despite having despite having some builds that could do that could do some manner of um spell casting I Actually, actually, no. I take it back. I forgot about a I forgot about astral. So I, I was gonna say that there wasn't much in the way much in the way of a traditional um, um, spell point limitation. But no, there's astral. So, so, so nuts on that. But I so as a means as a means of do as a means of putting a saving throw on myself, I'll instead ask on um, <laughs> weapon customization. Um, I'm get and given given how you mentioned Ratchet and Clank opened your eyes to. Um, science fiction gaming. I'm ge I'm guessing that um, being able to customize we weaponry and loadout was a was a prime um, factor that you wanted that you wanted to develop in the game. Yeah, and real quick, I just remembered something I could add on to the last question you asked, which is uh, in other worlds there's something called tier levels, mm -hmm. which is basically uh, at level one, five, ten, fifteen, and twenty, uh, you increase your tier level by one, and that does a lot of uh, good for the game mechanically because it will intrinsically uh, level up your abilities. Uh, so, for example, uh, the Vantikar, which are basically Dragonkin, uh, they have uh, breath attacks, and that goes up um, partially by their uh, tier level. So it will always be a useful ability even at high levels. It doesn't get outpaced or outclassed by the levels that it is or by the level that you are. Also, in other worlds, there's a lot less uh, scaling in terms of, like, once you're a high level, you're not just going to be able to, like, take bullets to the face and be okay. Like, you're still going to be uh, vulnerable. You're just going to have a lot more advantages in terms of your wisdom and your experience of the abilities that you learn over time. Uh, so uh, I, it's, it's actually kept very grounded for something that's such a high fantasy. Um, and in that way, it's very grounded in terms of it being something where you're not just uh, like everything can still be a threat to you. Uh, and it's very much built that way intentionally to where uh, there's a level of grit to it. And um, and yeah, so moving on to the next question when it comes to weapon customization. Uh, one thing that's cool is uh, one of the last big changes that we made to other worlds was the idea of themes uh, and basically th Themes replaced backgrounds. Uh, backgrounds are the idea of like, oh, okay, you come from nobility, or you come from the streets, or you come from this or that. Um, what's cool about themes is it works similar to backgrounds. Um, you can actually have themes that encompass a player's background, so you can still have a theme that's based on nobility or uh, based on being a street vandal or whatever it may be. Um, but in addition to that, uh, it's it's more open uh, because not only do you get two themes as opposed to the one background because, you know, for a character, in most cases, it only makes sense to have one background. But for themes, uh, there's not that automatic limitation. So uh, in other words, you get two themes uh, right out the gate and your themes could be your background, but it could also be something that um, is very reflective of your character that helps describe your character in a way and one of those things is an heirloom uh, one of those things uh, so like an heirloom that's passed down from generation to generation uh, which helps adds more to the story for your character but it also uh, can be represented in the game through your theme um, another one that actually speaks directly to your point more directly is a signature weapon so your signature weapon is actually a customizable weapon that you can have as a theme and you can actually modify it, upgrade it. You can give it different keyword mechanics, um, such as a spread fire if you want it to be more like a shotgun. Or you can uh, extend its range or however you want to do it. And as you level up, you can actually start modifying your signature weapon and have it level up with you. Uh, which is a perfect thing for anyone that's a fan of Ratchet and Clank or Ruby. Yeah. Um, speaking, speaking of which, when it comes to that, um, since you mentioned Ruby, I, I'd, I'd like to... I'd like to pick your brain a bit with a custom weapon I remember using in a um in a Ruby campaign years and years ago. Um, it was the weapon itself was called yet was called Yada's Talon. Um, you know, with with the idea of it being the, of it being one of the nails from Yada Garasu, the three, the three legged crow. Um. And the the but the approach I went with instead was. A um, a Nodachi with a whose 
who ha that had a um, had a lever action handle because I wanted to go full ridiculous and had a bit of a thing where th where um the whole the weapon's existence was because was because someone made a Mi someone made a Midas like bargain asking for a sword that could cut anything. The problem is this. The problem is because of that, sheaths don't last on the thing because it'll just cut right through the sheath. <laughs> oh man, that's rough. Oh. Um, but given that, given given that given that particular um set um setup, if some if I were to convert that to if I were to convert that kind of weapon in as into being a signature weapon in other worlds, how would that work? Yeah, so with uh, the signature weapon theme, there's a very simple um, sort of point system that you use, uh, and it just basically tells you, like, hey, uh, here's your amount of points you get. You can uh, spend this amount to level up its overall attack or level up its range or its magazine if it were to have one. Um, and then you could also spend those points to give it elemental damage or to give it uh, certain keywords, because uh, in other worlds it uses keywords. Uh, so you can eat. Uh, basically drag and drop different abilities uh, that signify you know certain things and then people once they remember the keyword uh, you can easily just have that there and it and it basically reduces a lot of uh, reading that people have to do and, and stuff like that um, so yeah I, I think you could very easily make that weapon in other worlds and honestly other worlds is a perfect system for people that love Ruby love Final Fantasy uh, Ratchet and Clank uh, Borderlands all that stuff all right. Given given that, let me let me pick your brain once again with something a little more FF related in the in this particular setup. Um, I know some people had some problems with the movie, and I cer I certainly did as well, but not as much. But I loved the concept of the first sword in um, Advent Children. This uh, this whole thing of a of a Buster sword that's actually composed of se of several smaller interlocking swords so you can have uh, multiple fighting styles rep represented all at once yeah found, so yeah you're talking about cloud uh cloud sword right where he can yeah. like un unlock them and then he can dual wield them and stuff like that yeah yeah um how would you re how would you re i do remember at one point representing it in exalt in um exalted and making it even more ridiculous where each of the swords is made out of a different magical material um <laughs> But how would you replicate the first sword in um, in other worlds using this um, particular setup? Yeah, well, I will say that's a bit of a hard question to ask me on the spot, especially without things uh, pulled up, you know, in front of me. But um, I mean, there is definitely cool things you could do with it. I mean, you would. Uh, I could even see a scenario where you have different swords with like different elements and stuff, kind of referencing what you just mentioned. Um, I don't know, like, off the top of my head exactly, um, like, what specific thing that you would do for that, but I I would definitely encourage uh, any anyone running the game to allow you to, to do that in other worlds, because it's definitely in the spirit of the game. Um, and I will uh, be sure that that's an option that you can do in the game. Uh, but off the top of my head, I can't give you, like, a solid answer in terms of, like, what exact steps you would take. In that case, I'll go. I'll go with um. I'll go with some. I'll go with something a little bit easier. Continuing on the um, on the on the FF train, and part of the reason I'm focused on that is because of a um because of a project that I've been working on on the side. But let's go. Let's go with one that. Let's go with one entry that is that is a very scub topic among among FF fans and and grognards, and let's let's discuss gun blades. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's where I felt like you're going with this. Um, because I like it. I like FF8. I know. I know it. Ha I know it has problems, but I. But um, I. But I would. Ra but I would rather. I would. But I would. Ra I would rather not be another person who who is just who is just putting FF6 on on the pedestal to the point where they have to where they have to tear everything else down. But yeah. For the purposes of this, um. I would. S there's two. There's two. Gu there's two gun blades to re to really focus on. Um, the revolver and the Hyperion. 
the Hyperion being the one that was used by Cy by Cypher and is more of a fencing style one, whereas um, whereas the revolver is more is more of a is more of a longsword uh, or e or even a hand and a half approach. Um, how would the how would those two be rep be represented? I'll start with the revolver one because that one's got a little more exposure. Yeah. So. In its most basic form, uh, the e the most basic and easiest way you can you can do that is you can have in the game it actually allows you to set it up like you would a revolver, uh, but then you can have a melee stat separate from that. So you would say, "Hey, this is a gun blade. Here is its revolver stats. You know where it has the magazine, uh, the attack that it adds, and the range, uh, and then you would have the melee stat separated from that, but." As part of the same weapon, but it would just be like, here's the attack of it whenever you melee with it, here's the stats for that. Uh, that's already something in the game. So that that in itself is like very easy to do. It's already part of the game. Um, so that's already there. Uh, when it comes to differentiating the the two different gunblade styles, um, that that is based on your own take on how you want to represent more of the longsword style versus the fencing style. Like if you wanted to say that with fencing, uh, it'd be able to like bypass armor easier, and you want to give it pierce as a keyword. You could add pierce to that version of the gunblade versus the um, the revolver one. You might add boosted attack um, for it, so it's going to hit harder, but it's not going to have the the pierce. So you'd want Hyperion versus uh, your more armored units, and you'd want the revolver versus anything else. Yeah, and I will, I will. Um, now, go, going it, going into some, going into something a little. The one of the other reasons that I that I brought up the fir, that I brought up um the first sword, um, is there's is there's one per, there's one particular. Avenue of combat that's all that's been very tricky for a lot of people to to utilize in a, a in a effective means without it being without it being too op and that is dual wielding. Um, I'd say you either you either have you either have p people putting way too many caveats on it, looking at you D and D third edition, um, <laughs> or you have it where it just doesn't really matter all that much, looking at you D and D fifth edition. Um. What is your approach when it comes to dual? When it comes to um, somebody wanting to dual wield? Yeah. So uh, with everything in other worlds, I like to make it as uh, smooth and simple as possible. So in other worlds, it's pretty simple. Uh, you can either choose not to dual wield, or you can choose to dual wield. And if you do, um, you basically get a minus two penalty uh, for each attack. If it is a small weapon, you get a minus three to your attack if it's a medium-sized weapon, and a minus four to each of your attacks if they're a large weapon. Um, there are certain things you can do to to further change those modifiers, but just like that's just the base uh, that most people would follow, assuming they don't have some sort of perk for dual wielding. Um, and with that, that's just enough to make it so people that don't want a dual wielding style character. Uh, just typically don't mess with it, but you know there are times where dual wielding might be something that is advantageous for you, or something that you want to do, or even just a moment for your character. It's a very simple rule set to say, oh, like you want to pick up that that knife and try to stab the enemy with it in this like fit of rage, um, but you've already attacked with your sword this turn, so just you know you get minus two to this uh, attack roll uh, because it's a small weapon. It's a very simple way of doing it. And uh, you don't even have to reference the rule book to, to like sit there and be like, okay, well, what's the caveats? What's this? What's that? Um, it's there to be as simple as possible. Uh, and I try to make as many of the rules that way as possible so you won't have to worry about having your head stuck in the rule books and you guys can worry more about role playing the game. Mm -hmm. um, and given, given that, I'd like to pivot into a, into a bit of a crate, into a bit of. What some people consider a cra the crazier end of my b of my build ideas, though not as crazy as the muscle wizard, um, <laughs> and that is so that is if somebody if somebody wanted to d wanted to do dual wielding when it comes to range weapon. Let's say that they want to go full John go full John Wu go full Max Payne or go full um, Grammaton cleric because more people need to watch Equilibrium. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's done the exact same way. 
you if it's a small we if it's a pistol minus two if it's a medium sized weapon minus three if it's a giant weapon or a large weapon it's minus four oh. I'd only consider doing 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 dual wielding when it comes to giant weapons if if I'm pl if I'm planning on having someone go full um go full true of Barton. I will pretend to understand that reference. Um Gundam Wing, specifically Heavy Arms Gundam. Gotcha. So I haven't watched the Gundams yet. I know that's uh my maybe shocking. I will say though, I love the music for Gundam because my coworker plays it. And it's fantastic. So I can at least say that. Um, of course, I could. Eh, I could also. Re a easier reference would would have been it would have been the would have been um, some of the crazier '90s shooters that I've gone with, especially since I'm a big fan of Blood. And one of the power ups in that one is Guns Akimbo, where you're basically dual wielding any weapon that you that you have for like 30 seconds. Um, although speak although speaking of that. One there's one particular signature weapon that I'd be curious how it would how it would work with your setup, and that is the su that is the super shotgun by way of Doom Eternal. So funny enough, uh, it's a game I have not played, though. From what I understand, the shotgun uh, I think heals you as you kill things with it. Is that correct? No. Okay, never mind then. See, I, I have not played, so <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Uh, first off, the super shotgun is the is the work is the workhorse. Just shotguns in general have been the workhorse of Do of Doom since day one, but the the super shotgun is is a double barrel, in and and, and is a fairly reliable was a fairly reliable double barrel for for the longest time. In Doom Eternal, they added a meat hook onto the thing. Basically, basically a um, hook shot. Um, you upgrade the thing, and you, when when something gets hooked, you have you can um, time slows down, so you can fi so you can fire while you're grappling towards the thing, and it's set on fire. And when enemies are on fire, they drop am they drop armor pieces. Because do because Doom Eternal logic. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it is basically a sh is basically a double barrel shotgun with a gra with a grappling hook. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So the d the double barrel shotgun part super easy. That's super simple to do. Um, with the uh, so so one cool thing about other worlds in general is uh, there's a, there's a couple points where it mentions and it mentions this at, at, towards the beginning of the book too because it's very important, mm -hmm. which is the idea of like if you come up with these cool ideas. Uh, it's very much meant to lend itself to be like, it's a yes and type game. You know, it's like this is something that the world master is encouraged to let you do. So with this, um, you would compare because because like there's not something in particular. There's not like a meat hook option, or there's not like an option in the book currently that says meat hook, and you just like slap that onto your signature weapon. But what you can do is uh, you basically would say, hey, I want to be able to have a feature on this weapon where I can grapple people at range. Uh, and then you look at things that are uh, comparable to that power-wise, you know, with different keywords, different abilities, things like that. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, okay, well, for a keyword uh, like this, this would cost three points. I'm just making this up off the top of my head because I don't remember the points off the top of my head. But anyways, say if it costs three points for, like, most of the keywords, then just say, okay, well, for this to fire off 50 feet away uh, or however long you want to shoot away and then uh, grapple. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you can compromise on that, too, where... You have a shorter reach for the grapple, but the grappling strength is, is higher. Or maybe like in Doom, it seems like it could probably grapple anything. So you maybe want the the grappling capabilities to be uh, very, very good. Um, and then that would just be more points. And so that's just something you put into the game based off of that. Yeah. Um, and give, um, given the... Given the given the given the given the um given the fact that you ha that you have your familiarity with um ha with halo i'll 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 ask i'll ask one of the obvious obvious questions and this is probably the easiest one to adapt but the um the plasma sword yeah so for the plasma sword it depends on to um what exactly about it that you want to translate over like the toughest thing for the plasma sword would be to 
translate how deadly it is, you know, because the idea of it, like, in the game is it pretty much one-shots almost anything. <laughs> I would... Uh, uh, um, when it comes... As far as, as far as what as far as what I'd adapt, I'd pro I probably I probably focus more on the fact that it is a weapon that relies on a char on a charging attack. Because when because whenever you see that thing get get in use, you have a case of them bo them bolting a few them bolting a few yards and then and then slicing. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna say. Is like it depends on you know it depends on what you want to focus on. So. I could see someone be like, no, I care mostly about, you know, it being able to slice someone in one hit. But yeah, if the lunging capabilities was your thing, you could uh, give it uh, a range boost and then say, like, whenever you attack with it um, at that range, you will move uh, to that appropriate range as well. So it's not it's not that you're attacking with a projectile, but you attack at that range and then you move to that range. My brother used um, to call that kind of thing a ranged melee attack. Yeah, there you go. A ranged melee attack, which, so, which sounds which sounds ridiculous when I say it. <laughs> but I fully understand what you mean. Um. Now with now, with that kind of thing in mind, there's as I've noticed, there's there's um, there's several versions of the core, of the core book that you're um that you're that you are kickstarting, um, uh, namely the core rule book, light. Dark and zero. Um, I'd like you to go. I'd like you to go into the differences between each of them and what they what they essential what they essentially are and what they, what's in them, what's not in them, and so on. Sure. So let me start from uh, smallest to biggest. So, Other World Zero, uh, you know, was released uh, years ago. I can't remember which year exactly, but it was released years ago. And it basically is your uh, most basic rules. It, it's your quick start guide as a sample adventure, uh, which has been uh, tried and true and tested and played multiple times. Um, and uh, has like a lot of your, your basic uh, things that you need, with the exception of character creation. Um, but, it, but it is a good starting point or a good basis for, for playing. Uh, other worlds um with the other worlds light um that is essentially uh what will be the player's guide or just everything that the player will not have to focus on um so it's going it's going to be the core rule book but cut down to where um it won't be it won't have the uh the worlds and and the like how to create your own world and the different enemies and how to create your own enemies and that kind of stuff uh that would be towards the back half of the book for the core rule book um, but it will have all the player character creation options. It'll have the rules of the game. Um, it'll have everything that's needed for a player uh, to play the game and to uh, get invested into other worlds. Mm -hmm. um, for other worlds, dark. Um, that one is going to be a trimmed down version as well. But that one's going to have everything for a world master, uh, with the purpose of it being more print fr uh, friendly. Uh, because the core rule book itself is going to have a lot of illustrations. It's going to have a lot of color. It's going to be a big book. Um, and some people's printers will probably not enjoy it if they print that out. They might get the printer might get very angry at you. Um, so other worlds dark is a fun way for me to sort of uh, respin some things and uh, redesign it in a way that your printer will be happy uh, with all of us. Well, and then other worlds, yeah, yeah. And then other worlds, uh, the core rulebook is everything you need for other worlds and yeah. more. And to be fair, my no matter what I do, my printer's get, my printer is going to hate me because it knows that the day that it goes kaput, I'm going to be giving it the office space treatment like I did to the fax machine. <laughs> yeah, and I have a bad, I have a really unlucky streak with printers. I'm like every printer I get just stops working. Oh, because and I'm I'm not kidding. When we when at my at my day job when we got when we got the printer replaced, we decided to take the old printer out back and um vent and vent about five years worth of frustration. I think I I ended up break I ended up breaking three bat three bats just beating the thing. And they learned stop. They learned if I do if they do this again, don't give me aluminum bats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a fun time. Oh, it was a, it was a, it was a therapeutic experience, and the thing was dead. The thing was dead in the water and got replaced anyways. So, so it was more of, well, we, we're, we're get, we're, we're getting this thing replaced. So we may as well give it a fitting send off. And by fitting yeah, send off, like, that means beat, beat the unholy hell out of it. 
it's like they have those uh, those rooms. I can't remember what they're called, but you just you pay money, you go into this room, and you just destroy everything in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess some people. I guess some people really liked the car, the car mini game in, in um, Street Fighter Two. <laughs> yeah, could be. Oh. It's a good game. But with uh, now with all with all of that in, with all of that in mind, um, I do want to I do want to give my congrats for um, for the fact that you managed to um, get funded in a day. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? And I'd imagine that because you're not doing a printed version, a um, release is get a release is going to be a lot um, smoother because you're not dealing with printers. <laughs> yeah, and that that I mean, I know that people. I'm sure there are people bummed out. I, I I haven't heard people like I haven't had anyone tell me that they're bummed out or anything. But I'm sure people are bummed out. That's not a physical release, but there's multiple reasons for it. I mean, one, things are still kind of wonky with COVID right now and kind of weird with printers and getting things overseas, and there's a lot of weird policies and politics going on that's kind of messing with that a little bit. And I've been seeing in different uh, board game design groups that they're worried about certain things going up. They're looking for uh, ways to print in the U.S., even though it's going to be a lot more and the quality is going to be less and blah, 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 blah. So there's a lot on that front. I also have a wedding coming up this, this fall, uh, and I wanted to be able to focus more on that and not stress out about everything I just mentioned uh, while I should be focused on the wedding. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to make sure that these uh, these PDFs are as, as good as possible. Um, and then when I put them out there, uh, even with me trying to make them as best as possible, I'm sure that uh, you and some other people might find a little bit, like, just tiny mistakes here and there. And so it will make me feel so much better when I do print out this uh, game physically. Uh, these tiny little mistakes won't gnaw at me in the back of my brain, and they'll actually be fixed. So I'll be happy with that. And it also allows me to do more of these. Um, it, it allowed me to do more PDFs. So the idea, like, Other Worlds Light, Other Worlds Dark, all that stuff, mm-hmm. um, a lot of that came from me not having to do a physical release because... Is giving me more time to focus on it being digitally uh, right now, so I can do that. But if it was going to be a physical release, then I I feel like I would be doing a lot of this other stuff on a smaller scale. So those are just some of the reasons. Uh, I already forgot the question you asked though, because I ramble on for so long um, that I just get carried you, away. <laughs> um, release a release window, not a release oh, yeah, date, yeah. but a, re- a release window. Yeah. So um, okay. So I believe. Uh, that this will be early next year. Um, I I have every intention to do it and finish it as quickly as possible um, because I have like 15 games on the back burner and I can't. Um, I can only do so much with those until I get this one already out there and made. So uh, in a way, it's like I'm very much encouraged and incentivized to finish this just on that alone. Um, but with that being said, I do have, I mean, I, I do have all the writing uh, there. Uh, yeah, all the writing's pretty much there. Um, a lot of the time that it will take will be me trying to um, get the designs right and just making sure that things are laid out in the best way possible. Um, that's going to be my biggest hurdle and challenge. Uh, as far as the game rules, the game mechanics, uh, none of that's going to take uh, time for me. It's really just the overall graphic designs and layout and also uh working with artists to finish up different art pieces and filling out the book with art Mm -hmm. now with i'll i will certainly be looking i'll certainly be looking forward to to seeing how that how that whole um how that whole setup develops um but with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for once again come um, taking the time out of your schedule to come up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Uh, thank you for having me. I, I, I enjoyed being here, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and I, I really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it whether it's to further discuss builds when it comes to other worlds or just to um, do glorified shit posting, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All right. Thank you, Mildred. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you. My pleasure. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!